But these facts, howsoever suggestive, may not be regarded as conclusive, and we shall therefore now turn to the more explicit passages in the hymns regarding the duration of the Vedic dawn. The first verse to quote in this connection is Rig Veda 1, 113.10. The first quarter of the above verse is rather difficult. The first words, which Sayana, whom Wilson follows, understands to mean near, Professor Max Mueller translates Samaya as together or at once, while Roth, Grassman, and Arfuk take Samaya Vavada as one expression meaning that which intervenes between the two, which has given rise to three different translations of the verse. Wilson, following the Sayana translation, For how long a period is it that the dawns have arisen? For how long a period will they rise? Still desirous to bring us light, Ushas pursues the function of those that have gone before, and shining brightly, proceeds with the others that are to follow. While Griffith, following Max Mueller, translates it as, How long a time, and they shall be together. Dawns that have shone, and dawns to shine hereafter. She yearns for former dawns with eager longing, and goes forth shining gladly with the others. While Muir, following Afric, says, How great is the interval that lies between the dawns which have arisen and those which are yet to rise. Ushas yearns longingly after the former dawns and gladly goes on shining with the others that are to come. But in spite of the different renderings, the meaning of this verse, so far as the question before us is concerned, can be easily gathered. There are two sets of dawns, one of those that have passed, and the other of those yet to shine. Now, if we adopt Wilson and Griffith's translations, the meaning is that these two classes of dawns taken together occupy such a long period in time as to raise the question, how long will they be together? In other words, the two classes of dawns taken together were of such a long duration that men began to question as to when they would terminate or pass away. If, on the other hand, we adopt Alfred's translation, a long period appears to have intervened between the past and the coming dawns, or, in other words, there was a long break or hiatus in a regular sequencing of these dawns. In the first case, the description is only possible if we suppose the duration of the dawns was very long, much longer than we see in temperate or tropical zones, while the second, the long interval between the past and present dawns, must be taken to refer to a long pause or night occurring immediately before the second set of dawns commence their new course, a phenomenon which is possible only in the Arctic regions. Thus, whichever interpretation we adopt, a long dawn or a long night between two sets of dawns, the description is intelligible only if we take it to refer to the polar conditions previously mentioned. The Vedic passages discussed hereafter seem, however, to support Sanyaya's or Max Mueller's view. A number of dawns is spoken of, some past and some yet to come, and the two groups are said to occupy a very long interval. That seems to be the real meaning of the verse. But without laying much stress on any particular meaning for present, it is enough for our purpose to show that, even adopting Alfred's rendering, we cannot escape from the necessity of making the description refer to the polar conditions. The verse in question is the tenth in the hymn, and it may be noticed that, in the thirteenth verse of the same hymn, we're told that in former days perpetually did the goddess Usha shine, clearly indicating that the dawn in early days lasted for a long time. The following verse, however, is still more explicit and decisive on the point. The seventh mandala of the Rig Veda contains a number of dawn hymns. In one of these, the poet, after stating in the first two verses that the dawns have raised their banner on the horizon, with their usual splendor, expressly tells us in verse 3 that a period of several days elapsed between the first appearance of the dawn on the horizon and the actual rising of the sun that followed it. As the verse is very important to our purpose, I will give the Pada text with an interlineal word-for-word -word translation. Those verily days many were which aforetime on the uprising of the sun, from which after towards a lover like moving on, O dawn wast seen not again forsaking. 
I have followed Sayana in splitting Jara Eva of the Samhita text into Jare plus Eva and not Jara plus Eva as Shakala has done in the Prada text for Jare Eva makes the simile more appropriate than if we were to compare Ushas with Jara. Literally rendered, the verse therefore means, Verily, many were those days which were aforetime at the uprising of the sun, and about which, O dawn, thou wast seen moving on as towards a lover, and not like one who forsakes. I take pari with yata, meaning that the dawn goes after the days. Yata pari, thus construed, means after which or about which. Sayana takes pari with tadrishki, and Griffith renders yata by sincere. But these constructions do not materially alter the meaning of the second half of the verse, though taking pari with yata enables us to take the second line as an adjectival clause, rendering the meaning more plain. In 452.1, the dawn is said to shine after her sister, Spashush Pari, and Pari, with an ablative, does not necessarily denote from in every case, but it is used in various senses, as in, for instance, 3, 5, 10, where the phrase shown occurs, and while rendered by Grassman as equivalent to for the sake of Brias, Osiana paraphrases it as roundabout, in the verse, under consideration, we can therefore take pari with yata, understand the expression as meaning after, about, or around which. It might also be borne in mind that there must be an expression to correspond with jara in the simile, and this we get only if we construe yata pari in a way as proposed above. If we now analyze the verse, it will be found to be made up of three clauses, one principal and two adjectival. The principal statement asserts that those days were many. The demonstrative those is them, followed by two relative clauses. The first of these states that the days referred to in the principal clause were those that preceded the rising of the sun. But if the days that preceded the rising of the sun, one might think that they were pervaded with darkness. The poet, therefore, further adds in the second relative clause that Though these days were anterior to the rising of the sun, yet there was such that the dawn was seen to move after or about them, as after a lover, and not like a woman who forsakes. In short, the verse states the unmistakable terms that many days pass between the appearance of the first morning beams and the sunrise, and that those days were faithfully attended by dawn, meaning that the whole period was one continuous dawn, which never vanished during the time. The words as they stand convey no other meaning but this, and we have now to see how far it is intelligible to us. To the commentators, the verse is a perfect puzzle. Thus, Sayana does not understand how the word days can be applied to a period of time before the sunrise, for he says, the word day is used only to note the period of time invested the light of dawn. Then again, he's obviously at a loss to understand how a number of days can said to have elapsed between the first beams of dawn and the sunrise. These were serious difficulties for Sayana, and the only way to get over them was to force an unnatural sense upon the words, and to make them yield some sort of intelligible meaning. This was no difficult task for Sayana. The word ahani, which means days, was the only stumbling block in his way, and instead of taking it in the sense in which it was ordinarily used without exception, Everywhere in the Rig Veda, he went back to its root meaning and interpreted it with the equivalent of light or splendor. Ahan is derived from the root ah, or philologically, da, to burn or shine, and ahane, meaning dawn, is derived from the same root. Etymologically, aheni may therefore mean splendors, but the question is whether it is to be used anywhere and why we should here give up the ordinary meaning of the word. Siana's answer is given above. It is because the word day, ahan, can, according to him, be applied only to a period after sunrise and before sunset. But this reasoning is not sound, because in Rig Veda 6, 9, 1, aha is applied to the dark as well as to the bright period of time. For the verse says, there is a dark day, aha, and a bright day, aha 
which shows the Vedic poets were in the habit of using the word Naha, day, to denote a period of time devoid of the light of the sun. Siana knew this, and in his commentary on 1, 185.4, he expressly says that the word Aha may include night. His real difficulty was different in that impossibility of supposing a period of several days could have elapsed between the first appearance of light and sunrise, and this difficulty seems to have been experienced by even Western scholars. Thus, Professor Ludwig materially adopts Sayana's view and interprets the verse to mean the splendors of the dawn were numerous and that they appear either before sunrise or, if Frechianam be differently interpreted, in the east at the rising of the sun. Roth and Grassman seem to interpret Pachyaman in the same way. Griffin translates Aheni by mornings and Prachyaman by aforetime. His rendering of the verse runs thusly, Great is, in truth, the number of the mornings, which were aforetime at the sun's uprising, since thou, O dawn, hath been beheld repairing as to thy love, as one no more to leave him. But Griffin does not explain what he understands by the expression, a number of mornings which were aforetime the sun's uprising. The case, therefore, is reduced to this. The word aha, which aheni days is the plural form, can be ordinarily interpreted to mean 1. A period of time between sunrise and sunset. 2. A nicthemerion, as when we speak of 360 days of the year. Or 3. A measure of time to mark a period of 24 hours, irrespective of the fact whether the sun is above or below the horizon, or when we refer to a long Arctic night of 30 days. Are we then to abandon all these meanings? and understand Aheni to mean splendors in the verse under consideration? The only difficulty is to account for the interval of many days between the appearance of the banner of the dawn on the horizon and the emergence of the sun's orb over it, and this difficulty vanishes if this description be taken to refer to the dawn of the polar or circumpolar regions. That's the real key to the meaning of this and similar other passages which will be noted thereafter and in its absence a number of artificial devices have been made use of to make these passages somehow intelligible to us. But now nothing of the kind is necessary. As regard the word days, it has been observed that we often speak of a night of several days or a night of several months when describing the polar phenomenon. In expressions like these, the word day or month simply denotes a measure of time equivalent to 24 hours or 30 days and that there's nothing unusual in the explanation of a Rigvedic poet that there were many days between the first beams of dawn and actual sunrise. We've seen that about the pole it is quite possible to mark the periods of 24 hours by the rotation of the celestial sphere or the circumpolar stars, and these could be, or rather must have been, termed days by the inhabitants of the place. In the first chapter of the Old Testament, we're told that God created heaven and earth and also light, on the first day, while the sun was created on the fourth to divide the day from the night and rule the day. Here the word day is used to denote a period of time even before the sun was created. And a fortiori, there can be no impropriety in using it to denote a period of time before sunrise. We need not, therefore, affect a hypercritical spirit in examining the Vedic expression in question. If Sayana did it, it was because he did not know as much about the polar regions as we now do. We have no such excuse and must therefore accept the meaning which follows from the natural construction and reading of the sentence. It is therefore clear that the verse in question 7.76.3 expressly describes a dawn continuously lasting many days, which is possible only in the Arctic regions. I've discussed the passage at so much length because the history of its interpretation clearly shows how certain passages in the Rig Veda, which are unintelligible to us in spite their simple diction, have been treated by commentators who do not know what to make of them if read in a natural way. But to proceed with the subject at hand, we have seen that the polar dawn could be divided into periods of 24 hours owing to the circuits it makes around the horizon. In such a case, we can very well speak of these divisions as so many day-long dawns of 24 hours each, and state that so many of them are past and so many of them are yet to come, as has been done in the verse discussed above. 
We may also say that so many day-long dawns have passed, and yet the sun has not yet risen, as in 2.28.9, a verse addressed to Varuna, wherein the poet asks for the following boon from the deity. Literally translated, this means, Remove far the debts and sins occurred to me. May I not, O king, be affected by others' doings. Verily, many dawns have not yet fully flashed forth, O Varuna, direct that we may be alive during them. The first part of the verse contains a prayer usually addressed to the gods, and we have nothing to say with respect to it, so far as the subject in hand is concerned. The only expression necessary to be discussed is in the third quarter of the verse. The first two words present no difficulty. They mean many dawns. Now, Ivushta is a negative participle from Vyushta, which again is derived from Ushta with a V prefixed. I have referred to the distinction between Ushas and Vyushti, suggesting the threefold or fivefold division of the dawn. Vyushti, according to Tatriya Brahmana, means day, or rather the flashing forth of dawn into sunrise. And the word a viushta therefore means the not fully flashed forth into sunrise. But Sayana and others don't seem to have kept this view in distinction between the meanings of ushtas and viushti, or if they did, they did not know, or had not in their mind the phenomenon of a long continuous dawn of an Arctic region, a dawn that lasted for several day-long periods of time before the sun's orb appeared on the horizon. The expression shown which literally means many dawns have not dawned or fully flashed forth, is therefore a riddle to these commentators. Every dawn they saw was followed by a sunrise, and they could not therefore understand how many dawns could be described as not fully flashed forth. An explanation was thus felt to be a necessity, and this was obtained by the converting, in a sense, the past passive participle, Ivayushta, into a future participle, and the expression in the question was translated into meaning during the dawns or days that have not yet dawned, or in other words, in days to come. But the interpretation is on the face of it strained and artificial. If future days were intended, the idea could have been more easily and briefly expressed. The poet was evidently speaking of things present, and taking viushta to denote what it literally signifies, we can easily and naturally interpret the expression to mean that Though many dawns, meaning many day-long portions of time during which the dawn lasted, have passed, yet it is not Vyushta that the sun's orb is not yet emerged from below the horizon that Varuna should protect the worshipper under the circumstances. There are many other expressions in the Rig Veda which further strengthen the same view. Thus, corresponding to Bu Yashi, in the above passage, we have the adjective Purvi, many, used in 4.19.8 and in 6.28.1, to denote a number of dawns, evidently showing that numerically more than one dawn is intended. 